Welcome to Team Perry's Step Out of Line podcast, featuring co-hosts Perry and Lori Finkelstein. Together, they explore, meet, and share inspirational stories with guests who have made a positive impact in today's world. This podcast resonates with our hope to make this world a better place one step at a time through love, acceptance, and uplifting conversations. I was raised at a dinner table where argument was sport and where we would argue politics or current events as a means of gleaning parental admiration. If you could hold the floor and make an argument, even from a young age, you got attention. We argued not in a harsh way where we didn't love each other. We argued in the abstract. So rhetoric was prized. Uh, And my father was a writer. He, he didn't work as a journalist very long. He, he came out of World War II. My brother was born right after the war, and, and he ended up uh, working most of his life at B'nai B'rith. He was the public relations director for B'nai B'rith. But he had a journalist sensibility in that the house was full of books. And we took every newspaper. We took the Washington Post. We took the Washington Star. We took the New York Times on Sunday. We, we read and we argued. That's how I was raised. That was the currency by which kids were acknowledged. I have two memories that sort of cut to the heart of, I guess, what I valued. One was, I remember arguing with two of my uncles and my father. So that's four Jews. I guess there were about seven opinions. We were arguing. And at some point, I guess I was like 12 or 13. My uncle Hank, he turned to my father after I'd made some particular point, like almost as if I wasn't in the room. He said, who knew the Pisher had a brain? It was like a moment of, because they were all grown men, a measure of acceptance that was like, ah, you know, I'm holding my own. But I think the first moment where I had a moment of journalistic rebellion was I was writing for my high school paper. And I wrote a piece that the high school administration was very unhappy about, about the ordinariness, the quotidian nature of drug use at the high school, where I didn't really condemn it. I was like, you know, it probably shouldn't be at the high school. You know, we should you should keep it at home. It was a very sort of reasoned, like, you know, we're all smoking marijuana, but, you know, you probably shouldn't bring it to class. It got picked up by the Washington Star, and they did like a, a follow-up on this this high school paper that had basically been so blunt about ordinary drug use. The high school was very angry at me. And I remember my father saying, well, you know, you wrote it. Is it is it true? And I said, yeah, it's true. He said, well, then weather the storm. That was a a moment because my dad was much more accommodating of authority. It was a different generational thing. I'm post-Watergate, post-Vietnam. I I went into journalism when journalism was much more of a hostile sport than it was for my father. And he never liked that part of it. But he did know enough to sort of like stand back and let me fight my own messed up battles. And I do remember that. That was the first moment where I made anyone mad at me. It's something I wrote. Not to say it was the greatest act of journalism ever, because, you know, I wish I had it over again to be a little more sophisticated about. But, hey, I was 17. I do remember my father uh, saying, well, if you hung yourself, you hung yourself. But, you know, I'm, it's, I'm not going to get between you and the, and the page. You know, you wrote what you wrote. That was that was a healthy moment, I guess. Like Perry, when she writes, like people listen to her and that's her her way of being herself. Words and narrative are a great equalizer. You know, you, you're only as good or as bad as the words or the imagery that you're able to, to produce to make your argument or, your, or, your, or to tell your story. I don't know what else I would have done with my life. So thank God I had stumbled into this. I grew up in D.C. My brother and sister, my older siblings, Went to school in, in Far Rockaway and, and moved down to Washington in the late 50s. You have two kids. Ethan, and uh, he was trying to write comedy. He's in L.A. now with his fiance. He was a working musician. He plays uh, piano, keyboards at a very high level, and he was on tour with a rock band. He doesn't like the tour in between cities. He, he loves playing music. He does not like the van, so, which is you know, 90% of what you have to do now to make money. He's temporarily put the music aside. 
and my daughter uh, is 11 years old. She has the soul of a 35-year-old divorcee from, from Long Island, so you'd recognize her right away. My grandmother and your grandfather were brother and sister, and apparently my grandfather, Adolf, was good friends with your father. They were very close friends. He died young, I know, your grandfather, but they came over to America on the same boat. I wish and I knew more. And they changed their names. Right. You, you became Laszlo. We, we were all Leibowitzes. You became Laszlo. And we became uh, Ligeti. That was from when they went to Budapest from uh, from Dranoff because they wanted to get jobs. And they, were, <laughs> they wow. were trying to hide that they were Leibowitz and Lef Lefkowitz. Is the family feud that developed? I know my grandmother might have said a few things, but are we all good at this point? I'm two generations removed from any of that angst. And, and at some point, the way it happened was another cousin had interviewed me. He worked for the Jewish Telegraphic Agency. And I did an interview in New Orleans uh, years ago. And then I did something else, a, a piece for um, uh, David Chang's Lucky on my father's love of delicatessen food. I used the name Ligeti in the piece to talk about my grandfather. And he showed the piece to his mom, who was my age. The, 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 the guy who interviewed me was younger. He showed it to his mom, who's my age, and she said, this is your cousin. And this would have been the brother Moishe's, the youngest right. brother's descendants. So I'm like, and I had to go to my mother and go, Ma, did Grandpa have siblings? She got, you know, only about seven. It was the first time I got into it. And, and you know, and she gave me the, all the background on why they had sort of gotten away from, uh, you know, Nanya and Nanya was a pretty tough fraud. She was a formidable woman. My mother, who just passed away a year and a half ago, even for her, it was all sort of water under the bridge. But she was like a little bit like, I can't believe you're asking me these questions. I wish I remembered. All of the Leibowitzes I talked to, when they got off the boat, they went to 234th South 2nd. They immediately were given a route for the bakery and a room. And from there, they moved on in life, some of them. But, but, the, but basically, that was the first stop from Ellis Island. Moisha's granddaughter. She told me a very funny story about the day after he got there and was given a bed, he was told to go to the Standard Bakery. And uh, he he reports and, and he says, okay, I'm here. What do you want me to do? And he says, well, here's your route. Here's your, here's your cart. Here's your, it was a horse-drawn cart. Uh, here's your route to, to serve these, uh, these bakeries. And he says, I, I just got here. I just got off the boat. I, I don't, I don't know the streets. I don't and Nanya apparently said to him, idiot, the horse knows the way. My mother's wedding, it was 1942, and she married a writer. My dad was a journalist. And, and uh, Nanya really liked my mother and thought this one should fetch a decent prize. Like a doctor. A professional or at least a pharmacist or whatever. Nanya had famously and proudly said her whole life she had purchased the right people for her children. You know, like oh the, the dowries and everything. She was old school. So she was very disappointed that my mother had settled for a scribbler. And uh, at, it was during the war, and, and, and my, my, my dad was about to go in the army. And, and Nanya and Helen were there, and, and, he, and my mother said, oh, I'm so glad to see, you know, so many of my father's people couldn't make it because of the war. You know, I'm glad to see you here. I'm glad I have you here for my wedding. And Nanya and looked at my father and said, from the looks of things, Dalink with the Hungarian right. accent. You don't have much of anything. My mother always told me the story of her cousin Isidore. This would be the oldest brother, Max and Regina. Max was kind of a ne'er-do-well. He had a terrible gambling problem and a little bit of a womanizer, and he was kind of a mess. But he was the oldest brother, and he had he had three kids, one of, one of whom died of a heart ailment, two of whom survived. Um, the oldest was Isidore, his son, who was a communist. And Isidore, not only was he a communist, but he was in the Teamsters. He worked at the bakery and he kept trying to organize the, the drivers against his aunts, against yeah. Nanya and, and Helen and Adolf. Like he, he was he was unrepentant about trying to organize. Anyway. He's in this constant fighting over the unionization with, with Nanya. And at some point, the Spanish Civil War breaks out. And because he's a lefty and a communist, he gets on the boat. He, he'd only been married a year to his wife. And they were living in the Bronx. Um, and he gets on the boat with the other communists. They all had their, their tickets paid by 
the CPA, uh, the, the party. And he's, he's going to Spain to fight against the fascists in 1937. I have pictures of him on the boat. He gets to Rotterdam. The boat was going to Rotterdam. And from there, they were going to go overland and over the Pyrenees because it was a, you, you couldn't go straight. It was an embargo. You weren't allowed to go there. Um, he's arrested on a warrant when the boat docks. And he's immediately put in you know, irons and sent back to America. Nanya had the alderman who she was tight with in Brooklyn write out a warrant saying he had stolen $3,000 from the Standard Bakery. And so he was arrested for theft and dragged back. She probably saved his life. The rest of them all went on to fight in the Spanish Civil War with the Abraham Lincoln Brigade, and and half of them were killed. He, he, He was forced to come back because Nanya was like, and at this point, Max Max had died and Regina died. So he was 24 years old, 25 years old. But Nanya regarded him as being her responsibility. No nephew of hers was going to die in Europe if she could help it. And she got him arrested and sent back. So I'm trying to research the story. It was such a perfect, like, overly Jewish mother story. that I said to my mother, I said, that can't be true. I found the documents. I found the arrest warrant. I mean, I found it all. And... Eventually, I reached his daughter, in, who's in her 60s and lives in Morristown, New Jersey. And I said, and, and it wasn't quite right. He changed his name later in life to Irving from Isidore. So like, it, what, it didn't match up in, on Ancestry.com. I said, I, I, the, date, the dates are about the same. Some of the addresses are the same. Did your father ever tell you a story about being arrested by his aunt? For, and, she, and she just starts laughing on the phone. She says, if you know the story about my father and Nanya and being arrested and sent back, yeah, we're cousins. It's a chutzpah thing to say, oh, I have a story to tell and it's a good story and you all should listen to me. It's rooted in a certain amount of arrogance, if you think about it. And there's an essay by George Orwell, a writer who can only be admired. It's called Why I Write. Uh, and it was Orwell examining very bluntly and very honestly his own motivations for writing. And he said at some point, I'm, I'm putting stuff down on paper because I think I'm smarter about telling this story. And I think I, I have a good story and I have the story that you should pay attention to. And I'm trying to show everybody that. Um, and even as venal and as, uh, egotistical as that sounds, acknowledging that part of what drives you to, t- to try to be the village griot, to, to come to the campfire with the story that, oh, I got a good one, pay attention to me, is a certain amount of ego and is a certain amount of, uh, I'll show you um, to anybody who ever you know, left you on the end of the playground. I wasn't laying credit for being as big uh, uh, a son of a bitch as it sounds i was really trying to say every writer has to acknowledge this in himself is that if they are trying to hold the floor um and have other people listen to them or read them um they have to acknowledge this particular uh streak of vanity we all oh wait you know i can tell a story so good that you won't you'll want to turn to the last page and and to, to walk into that um, unawares, I think that you get in trouble when you don't when you don't take stock of that in yourself as a writer. Right. That's when you get in trouble when you think when you think, oh, it's all noble. It's saying I will tear myself down in front of you because I'm th- I'm just that smart to do that and make you love me for it. Mm-hmm. It's a powerful dynamic. The writers who believe that they're on a noble crusade for truth only, I, I would prefer that what I write be closer to truth than not. Um, but if you think for a moment that it's all ennobled, that's when you get in trouble. How do you like having complete creative control over a project? That's the only way I know how to do it is sort of soup to nuts. The first show I worked on was Homicide. It was based on a book that I wrote, but it was, you know, generally it was fictionalized and it was, it was really the creation of Tom Fontana and Barry Levinson. And they taught me how to do TV. Those were my mentors especially Tom. What happened in television, particularly with cable, premium cable, was that 
um, as shows became less episodic, less 22 separate stories, more of like one story told across a season, they needed the writer to be in charge because they needed the continuity of story. So instead of the director or the star being the, the loudest voice in the room, suddenly the writers were empowered to run these shows. Um, basically because, you know, episode 10 had to culminate a story that, that took 10 hours to, you, you couldn't supplant the writer with any other talent. So all of a sudden we were thrown, as opposed to film, you know, the, the joke in, in feature films is get the writer off the set. You know, after, after he turns in the script, you don't need him. But here, since you're publishing one script after the other, and they're all predicated on the same story, you can't get rid of the writer. Um, and so they had to empower us. Um, and that's been good for storytelling overall. Um, the trick is to listen to directors and listen to your actors and make sure that you're taking into account other viewpoints. And, you know, the actors are very protective of what they think their characters could or couldn't do. The directors are very protective of shot, and shot composition and color palettes and things like that. But story, um, the modern TV vibe is that the writer gets to be in charge. I'm at the point where now I have enough collaborators. You know, I'm working on this current project with uh, a friend of mine, George Pelconis, who's been on. I've, I've worked on him now for, with four shows. And so now it's, we're among equals. You know, it's, it's consensus. You know, it's, it's, not, it's not just my decision. It's his decision. Uh, I've been with, I've done 150 hours of TV with a woman named Nina Noble who's like a director producer understands how to put film in a can in ways that I don't, you know, she understands the budget. Um, so I have my ears open and it's not just all me. It's, 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 uh, you, you create a consortium of, of opinion um, and you try to listen to other people. But in the end of the day, if there's something going wrong in the story and I, you know, then I got to sort of speak out. I can't, you don't want to let the train leave the tracks. It's good. It's 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 better than not being in charge. It's been a good ride. Um, and, you know, we've never really had an audience while the stuff was on the air. Not a big audience. People find it after the fact. I mean, The Wire was not a hit when it was on. It was after it was done. People went back to it. At any moment, I, I expect HBO to just come to me and go, you know, <laughs> we happen to have been looking at your numbers. And if they did, I would have to say, well, it's been a great run, you know, because... You know, we've done about eight projects now and it's all their money. So they're entitled to say, you know, we can give this to somebody else and maybe get a bigger audience. But we got to do the kind of storytelling we, we wanted to do. So it, it's been good. It's been a good run. I didn't intend to go into television. You know, I tended to stay in journalism and it just didn't happen the way newspapers were going. And, um, and, and the accident of having the first book I wrote get made into a television show. It was like, and then filmed in Baltimore. So I, you know, when they came to me and said, would you like to try to write a script? I thought it, I thought it was kind of a lark, a joke, you know, I didn't take it seriously. Um, until I did generation kill about the Iraq war, just because it had to shoot overseas because we had to approximate combat it was basically this road trip movie where a lot of extraordinary things were happening and had to be filmed credibly. I thought the execution on that was about the best we've ever done. I thought, you know, for the amount of money that we put on the screen, it was pretty, pretty well executed and said what we wanted to say. Uh, all the shows have different challenges. Um, filming Treme was the most fun I've ever had because I got to live in New Orleans for four years. It's just a wonderful place. And, and, and the musicians were a delight. And the music's a delight. And, um, you know, my daughter uh, used to march in second lines behind the band, you know, when she was a little girl growing up. But the one that uh, was the riskiest, I thought, was Deuce, because the themes about sexual commodification and misogyny and, and sort of what the pornographic culture has done to the American mind once you're trying to depict those and show real people negotiating that world, right. you're dealing, you're dealing with real actors and actresses and you have, the, the subject matter can often lend itself to indignity. You're working with colleagues who are entitled to dignity. We all had to sort of lean into 
our reasons for doing that and for why it was an adult theme and why we weren't going to be gratuitous about it. We were doing it for a real reason. We had something to say. And so that was fragile. You know, it's like if the camera lingers too long on a sexually provocative scene, it can be gratuitous. And if the camera veers away without saying what you meant to say, it can be problematic in another way. You almost don't have the courage to say what you need to say. So every frame of film had to be thought about and discussed by, by men and women who were trying to be grown-ups about the material. I wouldn't have tried to make that show when I was in my 30s or 40s. You know, I don't know that I would have been comfortable being honest enough or, or having people be honest enough around me to say what we needed to say about the piece. So the, all the shows, they all have different things where you're proud of certain things in it. And listen, I was proud of Plot Against America because I got to stick a bunch of stuff set around my dinner table. There was a line early on in that where they're having Friday night dinner and the father praises the mother's soup and saying, do you know what? You know, you know what you would pay for this if it was at Katz's, and, you know, dollar a spoonful. And and uh, the, the, his wife says every Friday the same. You say the same every Friday the same soup. I if I heard my parents have that conversation in front of us fifty times, I heard it once. I, I got to have some affection with my own family history. That one was nerve wracking because it was Philip Roth, and you know, I'm I had there were things I transmuted straight from the book. And there were things I had to change to make it work as film. You know, when you're rearranging Philip Roth, it's talk about chutzpah. We've never met, but, but blood is blood. And the truth is, you know, on hearing about Perry and hearing how much she had done, it just made me proud. I was, I was very proud to be related to you guys.